All right, folks, so let's get started. Thanks for attending. We're uh, really glad that you were able to join us today. My name is Chad Mummer. I am the head of client growth for LSEO.com. We are a digital marketing agency, full service digital marketing agency. And today we're going to go over some of the digital trends that you need to pay attention to in 2020. Now, if you are seasoned here, I might be going over some things that you know, but I'm trying to keep it relevant to like what's today. Uh, for people that also maybe um, aren't as experienced, uh, you know, want to make this educational and make sure we're kind of covering all bases. Again, we're LSEO. We're a full service digital marketing agency that was founded by internet veteran Chris Jones. Uh, Chris is a thought leader in the industry, has been around essentially since inter internet marketing was a thing. Uh, had another di full service digital marketing agency named Pepper Jam, which he sold back in 2008 to eBay. You know, we're a performance-based marketing company. It's super important for us to be able to do the best job possible. Um, one of our core values is your success is our success. So it's super important that we're, you know, performing and really keeping on top of the current trends that are coming out. As for me, again, my name is Chad Mummer. I am the head of client growth for LSEO. I have over 20 years of sales and marketing experience, over, you know, 10 plus years in the digital marketing space. Did come from more of a traditional media background and uh, once I kind of saw the writing on the wall and where the trend was going and just kind of who I am as a technology nerd, I uh, really wanted to get into digital marketing. So did that, you know, as soon as I possibly can. Love the stuff, love studying it. Uh, really in the digital marketing space, I've literally consulted with thousands of businesses, you know, over time and just really love what I do. And on a side note, uh, you know, I was a professional musician for the majority of my teenage and early 20s. Really, the one thing that I love besides playing music really is the digital marketing space. So that's another passion of mine. And uh, hopefully you can kind of see that going through the presentation. So we're going to be covering, you know, some interesting things that are going on. We're going to touch a little bit on search, on social, some of the new emerging technologies like you know, chatbot, voice search, and kind of go over some of those things. Now, again, I might not be covering everything that you want, and some of these should actually be a webinar in and of itself. So please, by all means, just let me know if it's something that you want to go more in depth with in a future webinar, then we can start to tailor a webinar around some of those requests. But first and foremost, since we are basically an SEO company, I mean, we also do paid media um, really the kind of the full gamut of digital marketing, I figured it would be a good place to start and, you know, kind of go over, you know, the state of search today. As everyone probably knows in this day and age, it's not a, it's not a big surprise that Google is the dominant uh, search engine. I mean, there's not many people that say, I'm going to go Bing this today. You know, Google has definitely, uh, you know, really have been the dominant, really since the inception of search engines, they're, one, they're the ones that really thought it out the right way. And um, honestly, just are one of the biggest innovators. So, you know, just looking into that and just, you know, since the introduction of Google uh, search in 97, I believe it was, um, all the other search engines have basically faced quite a hard time trying to reach the same level as Google. So over the past decade, Google has maintained really high market share of the search, as you can see in this chart, nearly 94% of that search. Whereas you have other search engines like Bing and Yahoo that have really kind of fall to the wayside um, over the years. And, you know, not that people don't necessarily still use them. It's just that Google has really dominated the market. And, you know, it's not even just what Google has done with, with search. I mean, they've expanded their services to email, productivity tools, you know, mobile devices, and um, among other technology Considering like even like Google Sheets, that whole suite as far as what's taken over essentially what Microsoft Office used to be. So how many people search on Google a day? It's crazy. I mean, they have 3.5 billion searches per day. Now, if you break that statistic down, it means that Google processes over 40,000 search queries every second on average. So also look at how Google search uh, has basically progressed through the years. So uh, when Google basically came out in 1998, Google was processing over 10,000 search queries per day. In comparison, though, by the end of 2006, uh, the same amount of searches were being processed by Google every single second. So in less than a decade, you know, Google went from becoming barely known at, to really an integral part of everyone's life on a daily basis. So, you know, Google search's growth rate expanded significantly in the first decade of the 21st century, 
but it started to decline kind of in 2008, 2009, and it currently is estimated to be around 10% per year as far as growth. So without even taking a look at this stat, I mean, we know that we're really dependent on Google. Uh, multiple times a day, you know, we're, we're turning uh, to Google to resolve our, our queries for us. About 84% of the respondents use Google in, you know, three to more times a day. This was a study that Moz did last year. So, uh, you know, Google search has seen, you know, many changes over the past few years. Google's also introduced many new components to the normal search results that, you know, we're getting uh, around a decade ago. So with updates like, you know, many quick searches like featured snippets or, you know, the knowledge panels that we have now, we get, you know, better results for what we might be searching for in terms of videos or images or where this might have been the preferred choice of searchers in the first place. So take it a step further, Google also introduced the people also ask boxes, which, you know, help searches dig further into the original query by showing them further questions that might be relevant to them. And I'm sure you, you folks have seen a lot of this before. You know, just like many other searches, Google is also a, a starting point for almost half of the product searches. So about 46% of product searches begin on Google. Uh, with the latest data, you know, Amazon surpasses Google when it comes to the product searches. Trust me, <laughs> the boxes that accumulate in my house is, is, is definitely living proof of that. 54% of searches actually are starting on Amazon now as far as product searches. Google's definitely a big player. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that really invest heavily too in like product listing ads, those type of things on Google. They're really, you know, in our, you know, from what we've seen in conversion rates, really have a high conversion. Uh, you know, if you're looking for something on Google, chances are you're, you're going to stay on the first page. You know, 90% of the survey respondents that Search Engine Land did um, in 2018, I know that's a little bit dated, but it's still super, super relevant. You know, most people are, are either not finding what they want on that first page or they just essentially just start a, a brand new actual query. So if they don't see what they want on that first page, they're just going to do a different variant as far as, you know, a different question that gonna they're going to ask. You know, this is super important to understand. Obviously, it's super important to be on the first page. You know, there's that ongoing uh, joke that, you know, where do you hide a dead body? Put it on the second page of Google. So, you know, anybody that's really, you know, in a business trying to focus on getting to that first page, we understand that that's super difficult, but really relevant that you actually put the, the work into it so you can get on that first page search result and to really dominate for those type of services that you're trying to promote. So I thought this was funny. Uh, you know, what was the, the most search term in Google for 2019? And that was Facebook. And the reason that I think this is hilarious is that Facebook and Google are basically fighting for ad dollars at this point. So, you know, we'll get into a little bit more into the social media component here in, in a moment. But just thought that that was a fun fact. Now, I think, you know, going into mobile, I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on mobile. Everyone knows that this is like a super important factor. You know, uh, Google has just recently rolled out what's called mobile first indexation. So they're really actually looking at, you know, your actual mobile version of your website before they actually look at the desktop version, which really does make sense considering on the percentage of traffic and the way this is really just exploded over the past several years with having higher speed internet as far as what you can have. We have 4G, you know, going into 5G at this point, um, you know, and really, I, I don't think there's another device that's on, on this planet that we use in technology that's as personal as our mobile devices. I mean, go into an, a restaurant in this day and age and look around and see how many people are actually interacting with each other. The one thing that, you know, a lot of my friends do when we actually go out is we make actually everybody put their mobile device in the middle of the table. And the first person that actually touches it is going to pay for the entire table. So this is how much, you know, mobile is actually dominating our life. And we'll go into to different things about mobile search here in a moment, you know, but I think one of the, the biggest things, too, is just kind of looking at the, the search queries now. We're going to talk about voice search in mobile and some of the optimizations that we're going to be doing and talking about really kind of correlate with both platforms. So really with mobile, you're looking at more of the long tail queries, um, informational queries like, you know, 
who won the most Grammys last night or whoever it may be, you know, local searches like finding a restaurant or, you know, somebody like a service based industry is like plumber near me, those type of things, um, you know, which is obvious. So, you know, transactional queries as far as just different things in that aspect, you know, research, um, definitely a lot of like the how do and really what I'm going to focus on more so is the conversational and the personal search. So, you know, personal search and conversational search are the latest evolution in how people search. It's definitely driven by mobile searches. Uh, the way people search has changed because they are searching on phones. This uh, must be taken into consideration when you're creating your search strategy. So it's a lot different um, creating a strategy kind of around mobile than it would be, say, desktop. Desktop could be something that's a little bit shorter. So we'll just use the, the example, that plumber near me or you know, when you're asking on the phone, especially if, it, if it's a voice query, you know, you're going to ask the full question like the way somebody would normally ask a question. So I, I also want to talk about, you know, conversational search as well. Let me just go back to this one for a second. You know, conversational uh, search is a reference to use uh, the natural language in search queries. Even with Google's BERT update, which is the latest one, is really focused around natural uh processing as far as natural just the way people talk so rank brain was the first one that really started that and bert is just personifying that and making it that much better so you know that natural language processing and having a, a natural conversation is really what search engines are looking for at this point and we'll get into how to optimize that for both mobile and search like i like i mentioned but couple things that you would want to do when it comes down to just the user experience and things that can really help you out um, as far as optimizing for mobile. So page speed is a huge difference. We're going to actually use Amazon here in a second to uh, kind of show the difference between how a website would load on mobile versus desktop and how dramatic that actually could be. Also, the responsiveness of your website. So, you know, how great does it look like on, on different uh, versions of phones? Is it easy to navigate? Um, you know, do you have expansive type, type of clickable assets, like um, just like different search queries or as far as frequently asked questions, those type of things. So also, too, just making sure that things are properly sized so you're not really taking a ton of bandwidth off of people either. One thing I always tell people, too, is that you're going to have different kind of responses with what you're doing on mobile versus what you're doing on desktop. So one example that I use for, with a lot of our clients is that something that you, like say a video that you might have, you don't want that to automatically load on someone's mobile because honestly that can take away from the user experience and they can get mad at you because you're actually using a lot of that bandwidth. You know, really if you are looking to design your website or revamp the website, really what you should be focusing on is the way your mobile responsiveness is versus the desktop. It's, the desktop now is secondary, whereas you know mobile was almost like an afterthought five to six years ago. So again, here is um, just the dramatic difference on how Amazon would load on a mobile version. So this is the mobile version versus is the, de the desktop version over here. So quite different. Now, when they actually do the crawl through a website with this, they're really kind of scaling it back to a three to four G bandwidth. So, you know, just to make sure that that user experience, if they have a slower internet connection or sometimes, you know, if you're in a bad spot, you only have one or two bars, you know, you're probably getting throttled down to a three G no matter what. So, you know, making sure that you're not only fast on desktop, but really focusing more so on how do we make that mobile version faster is really what's going to help you and give you a little bit more weight with search engines. Really, the way that they look at mobile speed at this point is either is your website really, really good or really, really bad. And anything in between is kind of they'll figure it out, especially with the content and kind of, you know, how how many people are staying on the page, you know, how many people are actually navigating to other places on the website, those type of things. But it's very hard, honestly, to get mobile to where it needs to be. Um, some things that you'd have to look for is, you know, you know am I losing it or using a ton of plugins? Um, am I not deferring maybe some of my images the right way? Am I not compressing the images like we were talking about before? Uh, is there too much JavaScript that, that's getting in the way of actually loading the website um, initially and slowing that down? So there's some awesome tools. I mean, Google has one itself called PageSpeed Insights. Just Google that term and you can test out your website yourself. Very easy. Getting into social media, 
Um, I mean, I think this is something we all know is is a huge part of people's lives and staying in touch with people. I mean, I think it's it's one of the most incredible technologies that are out there. You know, social media has changed the way we live our lives, essentially. So from the way we get our news to the way we interact with our loved ones, you know, social media is everywhere. It's unavoidable. It's powerful. And, you know, it's I don't think it's going anywhere. It's expanding. So since, you know, 2004, social media has been growing exponentially and it, and it hasn't reached the peak of its popularity yet. Uh, there's no denying that social media platforms are now a major source of news and information, but that's not all. I mean, social media platforms are unique in, in a way that they interact with customers. So not only do they provide a, a platform for users to communicate, you know, beyond uh, local and social boundaries, but they also offer countless possibilities to share, you know, user generated content like photos and videos those type of things. But, you know, the question is, is it worth investing in social media for your business? Should, you know, social media marketing be a focus area for your business strategy in 2020? I mean, the answer, I guess, depends kind of on, you know, the, the customers, but in no way should social media with your company or just with your brand in general should be ignored. You should be posting, you know, you know, things about it. It's again, when we come down to that personalization, the way, you know, people kind of connect now, you know, especially with mobile devices, you know, we, we don't want to ignore those. So, you know, with the popularity of social media platforms growing in the terms of size, uh, each platform has a unique audience. And if you cater your content towards the audience of the social media platform that you're using, or that's that they're using, I should say, then you'll be much more successful. So, um, you know, as it starts, as you know, like the start of the year, you know, we thought it would be a great idea to share, you know, some of the most important social media statistics and uh, staying on top of the latest social media statistics, you know, will help you enhance your marketing strategy and plan those interactions for your business for the future. So it's really, you know, again, like which which social media uh, platform do you choose? And, and a lot of things that you can be doing now can actually touch most of these. So, you know, depending on the demographic that you're using. With advents like social or uh, multicasting and, and live, which we'll go into here in a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll start to uh, talk about which platforms are going to be uh, the most appropriate for you. So I don't know why the magic number keeps coming up, 3.5 billion, but, you know, the usage of social media around the world is is always increasing. You know, it's it's without a doubt one of the most popular online activities that users engage in. So social media statistics from like 2019, uh, show that there you know are 3.5 billion like we said uh, you know social media users worldwide and that number just keeps getting bigger as the time goes on so you know that honestly equates to about 45 percent of the world's population which is just incredible to even think about the type of connection that we have um, in this day and age and you know I've spent you know a decent amount of time in Africa and, and some of those places and that's I, I still talk to those people almost every day. Um, through those platforms. So it's just a, an amazing way to, to, to keep uh, connected with people. So, you know, I think one of the reasons, though, for this high usage of social media is because, you know, obviously mobile possibilities for users are continually improving, which, you know, makes it simpler by the day to access social media, no matter where you are. So most, you know, social media networks are also available as mobile apps or, you know, have been optimized for mobile browsing, making it a ton easier for users to access the, uh, their favorite sites, you know, while on the go. So these are some of the social media users you know, by the generation. I don't think, again, it really blows people's minds that, you know, a lot of our, our younger group, like the millennials, you know, this is one of the main things that they use. You know, Gen Xers use it almost as much. And I almost kind of disagree with the baby boomers because I know a ton of parents and even, you know, some, you know, the people that are in my family that are in their 80s or so, uh, you know, my one aunt Maryland, I mean, she posts daily. She's always posting things, always commenting on people. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how, you know, I think multiple generations have really embraced social media and, you know, realize it's a, just a super powerful way to connect with people and, um, you know, connect with like-minded people as well, not just family members or friends. 90% of social media users access social channels through mobile devices. The demand for mobile-friendly content across social media is, you know, rapidly increasing and, and justifiably so. Likewise, almost 80% of total time spent on social media sites occur on mobile platforms. So smartphones and social media are evolving side by side, and your brand should make sure to keep up with those trends. 
So mobile friendly interfaces are, you know, the way forward. And if you're marketing online and you need to, you know, make sure that your content and layout is is optimized for mobile and and why not? I mean, people take their smartphones everywhere. And, you know, if you really want to be accessible, you have to keep that mobile in mind. And as you can see from, you know, social media marketing statistics, you know, different platforms can serve different purposes. So, you know, you'll have to be the judge of which social media platform contains your target audience and which you want to really market towards. And, you know, this could help shape your social media marketing plan just in general. So use these social media stats to get better insights into the world of social media and how you can maximize your search results using these tools. I don't have this in, in this slide here, but, you know, just to kind of get a, a glance at what it is, just go to a, a Google, uh, you know, go to Google and put in 98 data points of Facebook. So you can really kind of see, you know, how you can be granular actually with who you're actually selecting to target towards. And, you know, on average, three hours a day, I mean, people spend a ton of time. I think it's even more than that. Unfortunately, I think it's way more than that for me. And it's really kind of funny. I, I, I catch myself sometimes on my computer and on my phone at the same time looking at Facebook. So, you know, it's just a, a very powerful medium. And, you know, Facebook feeds off of this, you know, uh, social media, you know, statistically uncovers that, you know, in that three hour period per person on social networks, you know, it's just a, a very easy way to be able to, to really get out in front of your audience. And when you look at and think about just social media advertising in general, compared to other forms of, of advertising, let's just use uh, commercials. So commercials on TV, you know, that's more of a disruptive advertising uh, method. So it's, it's taking you away from something that you want to do and something that you're enjoying. We're kind of blind to that anymore. And to be honest with you, sometimes we're, we're rather annoyed with it. Whereas something like social media, we're basically giving people permission. Do they want to engage with our message or our brand? You know, whatever we're promoting, whether it's an ad or whether it's video or maybe an article, you know, you're giving people permission to be able to choose if they want to engage the brand or not. Facebook is, is absolutely still the market leader. Facebook remains the most widely used at this point. And really, when it comes to an advertising perspective, as far as business, uh, it's still one of the most viable options. Now, Facebook and Instagram essentially are the same platform. Facebook really has more of a, I would say a little bit of an older audience. So let's just use 30 plus up. Um, whereas Instagram might have a little bit more of a younger audience. And I think it, it, it's definitely intermixed now. I think Instagram is definitely taking off a little bit more. So, you know, it's something that, well, if you're doing an advertisement or anything like that, you know, it's something that the Facebook manager will help you really choose on who's going to be the appropriate audience, considering some of the target demographics that you might be using. And influencers are are super huge on, on social media. Um, you know, when it comes to either like with me personally, like I said, like I'm a musician. So influencers that are using maybe equipment that I'm going to buy or uh, I love skiing and stuff like that as well and mountain biking. So looking at, you know, some of those other influencers that are coming out with some gear and uh, kind of doing the review on the gear, you know, that social proof that people are looking for to say, OK, well, if these people trust it and, you know, they, they go through it thoroughly on why they enjoy or, or what the pros and cons might be of a certain product, then, um, you know, obviously that will be something as far as you're factoring into either am I going to buy this or not. Um, you know, and this is really too, it's not just the macro influencers, like the Michael Jordans that we've thought about in the, in, uh, the past. There's a lot of micro influencers that are really making a, a ton of impact for, for different brands and different products. Um, and honestly, a really, really good living. My one cousin, Jonathan, and his wife, uh, they travel all over the world. Uh, they, you know, hike mountains and they do like crazy athletic stuff like marathons, triathlons, those type of things. And they are endorsed by, I would say, over a dozen products. They get all those products for free and all they all the products really want in return is uh, to be able to get some of that social proof out there and to uh, review those products. So if you are in one of those spaces, you know, if you are somebody that has a product or maybe a service, even if it's um, a testimonial on somebody uh, saying that, oh, I use these, their service, I use LSEO service, 
and it was amazing. My, my business grew by 400 or 500%. You know, those type of things, those, those type of social proofs can really go a long way for the brand and really bring that human element to, to the brand itself. And it, you know, social media definitely has a ton of purchasing power, you know, whether it's retargeting or remarketing or really doing any type of push campaign. So push marketing through maybe like a new product that might be coming out that might not necessarily be that searchable. You know, this is a great way to get that product in front of people that are going to be the most likely to buy, especially, like I said before, too, with some of the targeting demographics that you have and how you can really use those those specific type of client avatars and creating client avatars on who's the most likely that's going to buy, you can really get your message or your product really in front of the right type of eyes and the people that would be the most interested. And storytelling, again, that personalization, that making sure that you, you, you give that human element to your brand or products, uh, you know, it's growing day by day. And, you know, we're 500 million daily active Instagram stories are, are um, being used worldwide at this point, as far as at the end of uh, 2019. It's pretty amazing how, how this can actually work, though, too. So I, I kind of use this picture because this was something I did in a story on, on Instagram. Now, this is our building. So, we, you know, we have a five-story uh, building in our city that we were in. And when we first purchased this building uh, last year, they were putting up the sign. And, you know, obviously, we're taking some pictures. So what I did is, is I actually told people that someone stole the M off of our sign. And it, it's unbelievable the type of people that were hitting me up after that. And th this is a story I did last year. I still have people asking me about it. So, you know, doing something quirky like that can really still get, you know, garner a lot of attention. And when you tell people you kind of did it, it was kind of like a guerrilla marketing tactic or whatever. You know, it's something that, again, brings that human element and, you know, more of a characteristic and personality to the brand rather than just being something that's stale. And, you know, like I said, some of the non-traditional social media channels that are really starting to gain some attention. So, you know, we're, we're just going to take Facebook, Instagram and Twitter out of this since they've been around so long. But, you know, WhatsApp is really, uh, you know, taking off. Uh, TikTok is, is really exploding over the past couple of years. Um, you know, since I would say probably about 2017. That's when I, I know that's when I first started using it just to to kind of understand what it is. Um, it's definitely a great way to, to kind of kill a couple minutes, but they're definitely being, you know, more used as an advertising platform and being monetized at this point. So while I say some of these are, are really right there, I mean, I would say probably more Facebook Messenger if it's more of a traditional base. Like, so if you're in North America, South America, Europe, those might be some viable uh, areas to be able to use. Uh, WhatsApp is definitely um, an international type of app that, is well facebook owns whatsapp as well so uh but these are definitely ones that you should really kind of keep your ears to the rail essentially to to really see if that's going to be the right type of uh you know social channel that you should be using now maybe it isn't now because a lot of these you know especially tiktok and um you know whatsapp i would say well really tiktok I, we'll just use tiktok right now instagram but you know those kids are going to grow up and if this is what they're used to, like, you know, when I was growing up, like Facebook, you know, this is something that's going to be just part of standard life. So maybe right now it's not the most viable, but maybe in a couple of years, it might be a viable option for you to really start to do some push marketing and, you know, through those type of channels. So chatbots. Now I, I do go a little bit into AI. I'm not going to go into a ton of AI here because I um, just really want to kind of talk about chatbots in general. Uh, you know, how they can really help and um, yeah, just go from there. So, you know, really the surge in on-demand messaging has, has shifted consumers' uh, preferences uh, for communication. So, you know, more industries are integrating chatbots into their business processes. You know, bots are a critical resource for enhancing the, the consumer experience and providing excellent customer service. Chatbots are also transforming the way businesses connect with current and prospective uh, consumers. So, you know, 2 billion messages are sent between people and businesses monthly. AI will definitely be a major uh, investment in, in customer experience for a few years. You know, 40% of organizations are expected to implement chatbots for customer support services, and 40% are expected to adopt uh, virtual assistants as well. 
So predictions of consumer-based services suggest that chatbots will be programmed to match human behavior, other similar services, and provide customer support. You know, it's easy communication as far as, um, you know, up the, on the forefront of the chatbot trend. So chatbots are really the technology that bridges between businesses and consumers. And this can help you provide like, you know, faster, more improved online experiences for your consumers. You know, almost half of the Internet uses, uh, users are, you know, in this, at least in the U.S., prefer to receive online support. Uh, from a living human being. So a majority of respondents referred to AI-based chatbots as, you know, kind of creepy, I guess. Uh, and, you know, over half believed that chatbots were ineffective. And I definitely kind of agree with that. Um, but, you know, it's just amazing how the, you know, how human, the human element is really getting figured out by AI. And we'll, we'll go a little bit into that when we, when we start talking about AI in and of itself. But by no means is chatbot, are chatbots going anywhere but up at this point. And, you know, some of the major industries that have really seen some growth through chatbots and are really profiting from chatbots are finance, healthcare, education, travel, you know, real estate industries. You know, I think it's just, again, bringing that that in immediate message for something that people are, 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 you know, having questions about at that at that very exact moment and being able to engage with that client or uh, pro prospective client or customer as soon as possible. Now, chatbots are, are most popular among millennials and baby boomers, which I really thought that that Gen X w was going to be in the mix as well. I'm, I'm, I was really kind of surprised when I was doing my, you know, just some statistical research for this, that, you know, baby boomers are really uh, uh, one of the most used with, with chatbots, but um, definitely a very interesting, you know, statistic. Now with us, there's there's definitely integration. So we use we've used several chatbots over over the years uh, with our own website, so lseo.com. And the one thing that I've found by going through some of the iterations of chatbots, just trying certain ones out, the one to me that seems most effective, at least right now, for at least for our business, is Facebook. Now. You can use AI, so there's a couple different ones out there. We use ManyChat. There's also Mobile Monkey, but this is a way that you could really engage with somebody immediately, 24/7. Uh, you know, have kind of a, a scripted type of call and response with this. You can really, you know, really, it's it's has how far you really want to go down the rabbit hole when it comes to you know uh, the AI portion of using any type of chatbot. You know, that's something I think that really more people are going to be looking for in the future as far as really building something more sophisticated around AI and chat. But the one thing that I found really interesting about Facebook, at least, and there's probably a couple other that you can adapt to this, but this is something where you can actually pick up the conversation later on. You're not just using a chatbot that's integrated into your actual website. You're using something that people use on a daily basis. So if you haven't heard some, you know, back from somebody, you don't have to worry about them abandoning your website and maybe possibly never hearing from them again. You can go back and say, hey, Joe, I haven't heard from you uh, since you uh, last reached out to us. How about we pick up the conversation and, you know, let me know how I can help. So, again, bringing more of that personalization and honestly making it easier for you um, as the, you know, as the uh, business owner or uh, somebody working for the business, easier to be able to pick that back up. So the next topic we're going to go into is is video. And I am just a huge fan of, of video content, observing video content online. I think most people are, you know, it's, it's surprising uh, how people are really, you know, consuming video content anymore. I really do believe it's, it's more so around, uh, you know, what you can do online. Um, you know, obviously YouTube, things like that. You know, YouTube is the second largest search engine on the planet, which so happens to be owned by Google. But at the same time, you know, think about all the do-it-yourselfers out there, all the things that, like with me, again, you know, do, do I want to learn something on guitar? And so what what is, you know, the newest thing I can learn in A minor as far as a scale? You know, it's very, very easy. I wish I had that when I was a kid, to be honest with you. So one of the main things I think that are really taking off right, right now are live videos. And, and the thing that's great about live videos is that you can multicast that through a bunch of different types of social channels. Uh, you can do it through YouTube, you know, so you can really get your message out to a huge amount of audiences on different types of platforms all at the same time. And that's only going to grow and, and get bigger. 
Um, something that we've invested into this year is creating a podcast studio. And I kind of look at video casting and podcasting, this live casting as the same thing. Uh, I think in, in a future webinar, we're going to talk about content stacking and how you can kind of leverage content and repurpose content. But, you know, doing these live chats, having that, you know, or not live chats, live videos, you know, having that over Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn is, is another one that kind of hit that live element as well. You, know, you can get out to a ton of different people at the same time and they don't necessarily have to be in the same place. So super, super powerful stuff. And interactive 3D video, which is another thing that you see really kind of um, picking up. So not only video, but just interaction in, in general, that 360 interaction. I see the RV community was, was you know, people that are selling RVs, uh, businesses that are selling RVs, I should say, are one of the first ones I really saw really start to integrate that. Also hotels, you know, what a great way to be able to walk through a lobby uh, before you're ever even there and, and get that out to somebody if you are somebody that owns a hotel or real estate, you know, real estate, being able to do virtual walkthroughs anymore is huge. You know, somebody in California might be able to buy, a, you know, do a walkthrough in some place in Philadelphia if that's where they're going to be moving, not have to worry about not seeing it um, in, you know, a first person perspective. So this is just going to keep getting bigger. You know, the cool thing, too, it's like, you, you know, with especially with um, things like Oculus and those type of things, being able to go to a concert or being able to go to a sports game and feel like you're actually there is not too far around the corner. Uh, there's there's already obviously certain um, aspects, certain games and things like that, that you can already have that type of experience. And shoppable videos. So this is something, you know, with like Instagram stories, Snapchat, those type of things, you know, having an interactive type of, uh, you know, platform and being able to have, you know, literally clickable assets within that video that could potentially take somebody right to that purchase funnel and purchase whatever that product might be right at that same time. Really having those type of shoppable videos. If, you know, it's again, I, I keep using music, but you know, if I could really watch somebody play an awesome guitar and I'm like, oh, wow, that's the, that's the exact tone that I want. I literally just did this actually for Amazon. So I just bought a, a new guitar. I, I mean, I spent a decent amount of money. I spent around a thousand bucks on it. You know, the way they had that interaction uh, through that, you know, really gave me that that experience that I wanted to be able to say, OK, you know, especially since a guitar is such a personal item. It's the first one I've ever bought um, and, and invested into based off of that. So this stuff definitely works. And it's something to think about if you do have a product like this or, you know, maybe certain services, depending on the service. You know, videos, too, if you if you really have seen like the way search has kind of changed, you're seeing a, a ton of different things now in search engine results pages. So that might be some of that, you know, some of those rich snippets or, you know, the knowledge graphs. But you're really starting to see a lot of videos in that, too. And what I mean by search real estate. That's what I'm talking about. So it's not just text-based any longer. There's a ton of different types of, of content that you can use that actually might get that um, first page search result if it's done properly and if it's optimized the right way. So, you know, keep that in mind. You know, it's not just about writing blogs any longer. You can create some, you know, really engaging videos, optimize those, have that on on YouTube, you know, or Vimeo, whichever whichever channel that you would want to use. But that could be something that maybe if your text isn't actually hitting that first page search result, maybe that video will or even that image, you know, so I don't want to leave images out of this either. But, you know, you, you can kind of get what I'm saying with this. So, you know, really start thinking about how you can diversify your content and, you know, not just I wouldn't say get away from blogs. Obviously, that stuff is super important. But, you know, how could you start to incorporate some of this richer type of content into your overall content marketing strategy? Also, too, training and educational videos are still continuously growing. Uh, this is definitely more around, I think, the technology, uh, you know, side of things, uh, software as a service. You know, people need to understand how to use your software. People need to understand how to use your tech and the best way to do that. And really, and I think this is still going around um, creating just a good experience for people is, you know, creating this type of content just to really make sure that, that the customer journey you know, even especially even past the purchase decision that, you know, they're con you're continuously giving them a good experience of the brand. Or in this case, you know, as far as what we're doing today, a webinar, just kind of providing some free, some free value and some, you know, some thought leadership or some subject matter expertise, if you have that, 
you know, this, this stuff goes a long way. And, you know, even in the past, you know, we've gained, we gained a ton of business by just doing some of this free educational stuff. I mean, A, we like to do it. And hopefully, you know, if you're passionate about what you do and you really enjoy what you do and you really, you know, know what you're talking about, this, this stuff should be fairly easy for you and something that honestly you might enjoy doing. And again, you know, personalization of, of a brand, there, there's going to be a ton more stories coming out through through different mediums like Facebook, YouTube, and, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, Snapchat is another one where you can put together some quick content, you know, TikTok as well. Again, just keep this in mind and, and think about that when you're really trying to tell the story of, of your brand. So how do we tell that story and make, make our brand more engaging? You know, I don't know if you remember when voice search required actually calling a phone number from your mo mobile device and actually saying, you know, what you're actually searching for. That was what voice search looked like in its infancy. And that was, you know, not even too long. Well, I guess maybe it is a little bit longer ago, but around 2010 when it really started to come out. And, you know, it's a little... To little surprise, few people actually used it. I think I might have used it myself about two times. But since then, voice search has improved significantly. Way back in like June 2011, you know, Google announced that they were starting to roll out voice search on Google.com. You know, at first, the feature could be accessed only through English. Now, today, I think there's probably about 60 different languages that Google voice search supports. The first uh, Hummingbird update, which was like in 2013, you know, the concepts of typed and spoken search changed a lot. Uh, the updated algorithm emphasized you know, that na natural language processing that we were talking about before and was aimed at considering, you know, the user's intent in the context of that query. So from then on, you know, search questions structured in sentences have, you know, returned to more relevant answers. So, you know, with voice search, people typically ask, you know, long form content as they would normally speak. The Hummingbird update gave that huge push to voice search optimization. And I, I think I utilize this probably more for, for local search as well. I mean, I, I've, I've noticed even myself, like over the past year or so, instead of typing anything, if I'm on my phone, and again, I think most of us are searching on our phones today, you know, we just, just hit the button and, and talk to it. It's gotten so good over the years. It's just amazing. Even sometimes if if you even kind of stumble through uh, what you're saying, how we can actually figure it out. Local search is definitely one. So restaurants near me or, hey, hey, Google, um, you know, where can I find the best pizza in, in, you know, that might be. So that's just continuously growing. But they're definitely it's more growing in that trend towards local search. And it's becoming more of a voice based search. And I mean, we're, we're kind of going screenless here. I mean, think about you know, what's out there right now with either Alexa or Echo or, um, you know, Siri or, you know, Google Home, you know, now we don't even have a screen. We don't even need one. We just ask in the air and we receive our answers. Now, there's some bad things about that. I mean, especially in an SEO perspective is that no one's clicking into your website at that point and they're getting that information served up pretty much for free. There's not, there's not really much return. You know, those are some some of the downsides of it. But really, no matter what, we are going more towards that direction. And it really is something that you really need to optimize for. And we'll go into that in a second as far as some of the, the tactics that you can use. You know, optimizing for featured snippets. Now, this is done through through what's called schema markup. So, you know, this is a way that you can get to that zero position. And what we mean by zero position is the position before you actually start seeing some of that those text-based search results coming up. So I'm sure many of you have, have seen this come up over the past several years around some basic topics. You know, it, it, even with basic topics, you know, Google might even actually read that to you automatically, even if you're just using your mobile phone and not, um, you know, something like like Google Home or or Alexa. Um, you know, people are definitely building more skill sets around this as well. So, you know, it's definitely something that you would want to do. And now, again, this is for mobile and this is really kind of for voice search. So there's kind of a, a two thronged approach here as far as the same type of tactic that you would use um, for both voice and to help with mobile. So structured data is is what we're talking about here as far as schema markup, stru structured data. So you know, this is just a better way to really give all the information to search engines to really truly understand, you know, what that content is on, on your on your website or on a web page. Uh, I use this because I think it's just the easiest way to represent it. So an apple pie recipe, you know, this is stuff that you would see in those, you know, featured snippets like we were showing before. 
you know, this is something again that can help you get five star ratings or whatever your rating is, you know, in, in a natural search, but also helps search engines understand in a voice search perspective, giving them, them more information on content represents. And so, you know, optimizing your content, like we were talking about before, you know, it's definitely more around the, the longer tail keywords and questions. So, you know, I think every time I really kind of do um, a consultation with a lot of people, people are super focused on on keywords, how to get keywords in, you know, how many keywords need to be in there. You know, everyone has probably heard of keyword density, those type of things where I want you kind of take a, a different approach on how you really start to think about this stuff any longer. So, you know, think about it as a seeded topic. So, you know, voice search. What are some of those subtopics that are around it? So natural language, okay, organic traffic, voice so, search, SEO. You know, this can give you a better content. picture on what people are actually asking. But most importantly, you know, using uh, search tools like, you know, what we're using right now for this would be SEM Rush. There's a couple other ones out there that you can find as well, but it will start to help you actually understand, you know, what are people asking around a certain topic? You know, I just use voice search for this as, as an example, but this is how you can start to craft some of those frequently asked questions and really become the authority around a certain topic. Whatever the case may be, if it's, if it's a service or a product, start using tools like this or make sure that at least if you are using an SEO company or a digital marketing company in general, that they're taking more of a, a topical approach to your content and really optimizing it for what people are really asking around a certain topic. Now, lastly, we're, we're going to talk about AI. I mean, this you know, AI is kind of scary. You think about uh, some of the movies like, I mean, The Terminator, you know, what happened in that aspect when, when AI was able to become a you know, self-aware, those type of things. But right now, it's it's an amazing tool to be able to really understand. Artificial intelligence has, you know, undoubtedly been technology story of the 2010s. And it doesn't look like, uh, you know, the excitement is going, you know, to wear off. So, you know, the past decade will be remembered as a time when, you know, machines that can truly be thought of as intelligent as in like, you know, capable of thinking and learning like we do started to become a reality outside of science fiction. Well, you know, no prediction engine has yet really been built that, you know, can plot the course of AI over the coming decade. We can be fairly certain about, you know, what might happen over the next year or so, uh, you know, spending on research, development, deployment and debate over, you know, wider social implication rages on. So, you know, meanwhile, you know, the incentives only get bigger for those looking to to roll out AI driven innovation in some of the new areas, like as far as their industries or fields of uh, science, you know, really kind of data, our day to day lives. AI in search. So we have, you know, a couple that we've already talked about. So, you know, voice search, you know, Google's rank brain is really their first AI that they've put out that has significantly changed search results and significantly uh, changed, you know, the way, you know, search engines work in general. And then we have some of those newer technologies like we were talking about, like Alexa, you know, Google Home, Apple Siri, those those type of things. And really, too, AI and web design is, is something that might be something, you know, very in the near future that we might not, you know, don't need to be a programmer or a designer in this day and age. This could be something that a website can be just built by AI in and of itself. So there, you know, there's already applications like Grid that use our artificial intelligence to design website based on user, you know, provided information like images, text, calls to action, those type of things. And they can make the website look professional in, in much less time, you know, sometimes at an unbeatable price. So it'd be interesting to see how this comes out. Honestly, if it's done the right way for, you know, SEO and search engine optimization to uh, see if that's going to be a viable option. Your user experience you know, and just through intelligent algorithms, like it's possible that, you know, to personalize an experience on, on the website, you know, after analyzing thousands of data points on a single user, you know, it can include like location, uh, demographics, devices, interaction with sites. You know, AI can display offers and in content that are more appropriate for each user. 3% of uh, marketers surveyed used AI to provide personalized web experiences. And when they were asked about the benefits of uh, personalization driven by AI, 63% responded that it increased conversion rates and improved the customer experience. So again, this could be something that, again, I don't think a human element, if it's going to be done the right way and you really want to be progressive in the type of results that you're getting, I think AI is definitely becoming more of an assistant 
to web developers and designers and SEOs alike, you know, people that are, are looking for user experience and being able to possibly tailor that user experience around, you know, different people. So, you know, just because you have one website, you know, just like anything else with, with design, you might think it's amazing and, and that you love it. Your entire team loves it. But, you know, that one other customer that might come that might be a high value customer and maybe just doesn't like it. So, you know, it, it's interesting to even think about, like, how it could possibly be malleable to, you know, people that are actually coming to your website and literally in real time, you know, turn that website into something that might be more appropriate for that specific user. So that's exciting to think about when you think about it and, you know, how web design could change with AI in the future. And, you know, I don't believe that this is, this is far off, but, you know, obviously we all know AI and chat bots are, are, are being highly integrated today. Like I said, we're using, you know, an AI software called ManyChat. There's like Mobile Monkey, those type of places that you can use chat bots. A lot of chat bots do come with their own AI. Some of that stuff is, could be rather clunky. But, you know, again, it's getting better and better over the years. And it's definitely a great way to be able to, again, immediately engage with, uh, you know, the prospective clients and be able to really tailor it over time to really feel more human in the way you would actually interact with them until you have the time to be able to go and do so. Um, you know, with us, it's, it's definitely helped us improve uh, conversions as far as just the engagement in general on our website with after hours and, you know, getting people from overseas uh, to be able to engage with them and, and eventually get back to them. So, uh, you know, also too, with predictive analysis, you know, being able to predict the future, obviously that's what everyone wants. And being able to use this this type of AI to be able to predict maybe certain changes that you make in your, say like your sales funnel or, um, you know, things like that. Like I use a, a program called Giru that can help us kind of predict what our conversions rate would be uh, by changing certain things, say if it's in drip campaigns or um, just, again, if we introduce a different type of landing page, what those conversions might be. And this, you know, this type of software is only going to get better. But really, that's what we had today. You know, this is kind of something a little bit newer that we're starting this year and we want to be more progressive. I mean, you know, over the past, you know, couple of years we've done these, but we're going to try to be more consistent. And really we want to start, you know, tailoring this around to what you folks want. So we're going to send a survey out after this to uh, kind of get some of that information, what you'd want to go over with us. Um, it's not going to just be me doing these as well. So, you know, hopefully uh, if you guys are still sticking around, I really appreciate it. Uh, but let me see, let's see if we can uh, see if we have any questions here and see if we can uh, help anybody out. Just one moment. All right, folks, I might be having some problems here with our webinar series. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will email all of you as well. So, you know, if you have any any, any type of questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you guys are a business and you want to uh, set up a consultation, you know, by all means, I'll be happy to uh, jump on, you know, a quick 15-minute phone call or so to really see how, you know, where you guys are at and, you know, how we can help. But again, my name is Chad Bummer. Uh, we're with LSEO.com. If you want to email me, my email is super simple. It's chad at LSEO.com. All right, folks, thanks for attending, and let me know if, uh, if there's any way else that I can help.